All right. Well, welcome to day three of the 17th Vermont Organics Recycling Summit, organized by the Composting Association of Vermont in partnership with Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. I'm Natasha Duarte, the director of the Composting Association of Vermont. This year's summit is being held as a kickoff event for International Compost Awareness Week, which starts on Sunday, May 7th. International Compost Awareness Week is the largest and most comprehensive education initiative of the composting industry. And we've adopted this year's theme, which is for healthier soil, healthier food, compost. I just wanna give a call out to UVM students in Deb, uh, Dr. Deb Nair's Composting Ecology and Management class. When during that class, they always do this International Compost Awareness Week poster creation. And the, the poster on the right is from that. Uh, and you can see all of the, the full collection of the class's posters on the Composting Association's website at compostingvermont slash V-O-R-S. And uh, click on those, those images and you can read a little bit about the students' inspiration for those posters that they made. I always like to start with thanking our fabulous sponsors. They are the ones who allow us to put on this full week program free of charge to participants, which has really helped us increase access and participation among a wide group of people, which is fabulous. And our sponsors include Community Bank, Nature Cycle, Eco Products, Vegware, Addison County Solid Waste Management District, AgriLab Technologies, Vermont Natural Ag Products, the, the Moodoo Producers, the Vermont Produce Program from Vermont Agency of Agriculture, uh, Farms and Markets, and RMI. So thanks to them for helping us put on this fabulous week-long program. As I said, we are here today on uh, day three of the summit, Wednesday, and this is the Haller's Roundtable session. This is going to be an open session. I'm going to um, be, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, we're just going to have a conversation about hauling organics in the state of Vermont. I'm joined today by Josh Kelly, the Solid Waste Program Manager at the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, and Ben Gothier, who's an environmental analyst for Vermont DEC Solid Waste Management Program's certification section. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and and invite Josh or Ben to uh, maybe have some opening comments to get us going. Yeah, th thanks, Natasha. Um, I'll start and I'm gonna hand it over to Ben really quick. Um, folks, really excited to have you all here. Um, we have held this session, which has been kind of a evolving session over the past, I wanna say maybe as long as seven years, where it started, I think even as a lunch in the cafeteria session, um, and then evolved into a formal session. Um, but I really want to make sure that information we're sharing is helpful to you all and that you're able to share ideas. And, and if we can get an idea of how many food waste haulers are in the mix, that would be uh, helpful as well. But let me first turn it over to my colleague, Ben uh, Gothier, and he can kind of give you a status update on where, where we've been. Sure. Thanks, Josh and Natasha. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see so many people in the room. And, and first of all, before we get started, big thanks to Natasha and the CAV folks and everybody that was involved with pulling this together, because it's it's a pretty big lift to get VORS going and do all the planning and, and coordinate things. So uh, sincere thank you, because this is such a, a gem of a resource for organics recyclers. So thank you for that. Um, to build off something Josh said, I was going to ask folks that are here, uh, there's a lot of names I don't recognize. So I was hoping um, while we're sort of setting the table with where we're at with things, if folks would be willing to um, put their affiliation in chat, or if you're an organics hauler, uh, regardless of whether you're in state of Vermont or in another state or another country, even potentially, um, just put if you haul organics, your affiliation in which country or state, that would be really helpful for us to kind of um, decide where the conver conversation should go. Um, all right, so with that, I think what we'll do is we'll just start off by setting the table a little bit. Um, some folks that are here in Vermont may have been involved. Other folks are probably unaware. Um, there was an act called 170 that passed in 2022 that has um, revolving around organics management in Vermont that has been uh, kind of a big project for us here at a and um, It did a number of things. Mainly, it imposed a moratorium on um, new permits for depackaging facilities or expansion of existing facilities. 
um, until we conducted rulemaking to govern depackaging. So that's something we're working on in the background. Um, it also required ANR to convene a collaborative stakeholder group, and it specified which industry sectors we should in involve. Um, and that occurred last year. We had a really great stakeholder process involving um, seven stakeholders, uh, a lot of the public participation. We had eight meetings. Um, <clears throat> and that stakeholder process was supposed to do a few things. Um, it was supposed to uh, make recommendations on um, whether the hierarchy, the Vermont Organics Recycling Hierarchy, should apply to all generators. That was one of the criteria they were to look at. Um, it, it, the stakeholder group was also supposed to um, review ANR's existing 2020 policy on the source separation of organics, um, and then also uh, make uh, recommendations on the proper use of depackaging in organics management. So that was the three things that the stakeholder group was supposed to review. Um, it's a little bit off topic here, but that stakeholder group report uh, lives on our stakeholder group website on our, on our um, uh, ANR's webpage. If you Google stakeholder group website, uh, you can find it pretty easily. A lot of information in there and a lot of great recommendations from that stakeholder group. Um, one of the recommendations that the stakeholders provided us with uh, was that we should, in fact, revise our 2020 policy on source separation of organics. Um, and that sort of brings us to what we're talking about a little bit today. Um, so in 20, what was it, this year, is this February, right, Josh, that we issued the draft policy on um, uh, source separation of organics and how to handle them in the state of Vermont that had a lot of new, um, I wouldn't say, not necessarily new, but it sort of put out there on paper a lot of requirements for generators, for haulers and facilities alike. Um, and the intent of that was to support source separation in the state. Um, I mean, the, the source separation requirement already exists in statute, but we want to provide the generators, the haulers, and the facilities a little more guidance and a little more structure um, so that they knew what the requirements were and also to support them. Um, because we were hearing from a lot of generators and a lot of facilities that uh, you know contamination was showing up at their facility or in the, the materials they were managing, and they felt a little bit powerless to, to deal with it um, because sometimes a load that's tipped at a facility uh, might be aggregated from you know, more than one facility or even 25 or, you know, 30 residents. Uh, so it's really hard to pinpoint uh, where contamination could be. So what we tried to do was we tried to develop the policy uh, in a way that sort of uh, outlined the requirements for haulers. I guess I'll focus on haulers now um, so that they knew what their, what their obligations were when they pick up a load, um, but also to provide them some protections. So if they get to a, if they have a, um, let's say you're a hauler and you have um, a customer that's, you know, you had conversations back and forth. You said, hey, listen, these organics have a, a lot of contamination in them. And we we first were picking some stuff out, but it's becoming um, a little bit of a problem for us that it's reoccurring. It's a bit of a chronic thing. Here's what we'd like you to do and provide the hauler some tools that they can use um, to have that correspondence with the, the generator. Uh, because ultimately, I think we all believe that everyone wants to do the right thing. Um, and, and just a little bit of conversation starter and some resources to do that might go a long way to clean up the organic stream. Um, the second benefit that it provides to the haulers is um, uh, we were hearing from haulers uh, in Vermont that, you know, if they were having that conversation with the generator, the generator could say, hey, listen, you're asking too much for me. I'm going to go with hauler Z over here that doesn't ask me to do the same thing. So this policy is an attempt to level the playing field for all haulers in a way that you know the generator can't just circumvent um, the requirements of the requirements. They're out there, they're public, um, and chronic uh, you know contamination from any point source should be pointed to A and R uh, for follow up. Like we we have folks here, uh, including myself, that'll make phone calls to generators, uh, do outreach, uh, remind them of the requirements, and sort of do that education piece on the benefit uh, to benefit the haulers and the facilities uh, downstream. Um, so I think with that, uh, that's sort of it in a nutshell. There's a lot of information I tried to put in in a very short amount of time. Um, but what we might do now is pause and take a, a look at the chat and just see where folks are from. And then we can kind of um, just decide where to go from there. Josh, I don't know if you had anything to add to that while I'm reading yeah, these. Or... Um, yeah, I encourage folks, if you're comfortable, turning on your cameras. And I know this is like 
Gee, I was just signing up to watch a webinar, not to be part of it. But um, this this can be participatory. I mean, really, the Holler Roundtable is about people and about people asking questions and interacting. Um, I do see from the chat um, that we do have at least a few Holler related or business related individuals here, as well as many municipal government officials uh, from Vermont and maybe a few elsewhere um, that work in the organic sector doing outreach and education so they're so they're 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 connected to it um and i'm putting a thumbs up by everybody's comment but i may have to stop doing that because i can't multitask very well so I'll stop. but anyway thank you for putting your affiliations in the chat um i think i would just echo what what ben said um to add that organic spans are tricky and um as I've worked in this field of rolling out Vermont's food waste ban, this is for people in the state and outside the state, there are pinch points. There's pinch points with packaged food. There's pinch, pinch points with education and information, cost efficiencies, um, and the things that drive our behaviors, which tend to be one of the couple of the big ones are uh, time and money, but there's also, um, you know, our, our, our drive to protect human health and the environment and to um, support an equitable system um, that also uh, is not is not adding a lot of um, negative in, impacts to the to the landscape um, in terms of waste management. So food waste management, food waste recycling systems have been evolving. And as you uh, look at the food waste stream, you know, we have evaluated that a lot of it is still in packaging. And so how do you square that? You have um, in Vermont a long history of good source separation practices and good uh, nonprofit, for-profit entrepreneurs who piloted and stewarded um, effective programs to get organics out of the waste stream. And they did that primarily through um, source separation. And um, that works in most cases, I mean, I think I can safely say that most generators of waste, of food waste in Vermont, um, are were source separating and are source separating. Um, and then you come down to the, the tricky stuff of a food manufacturer who produces maybe as much as a tractor trailer load once in a while of packaged food waste. And how do you deal with that? How do you deal with six pallets of um, canned goods that are not able to be fed to people or not suitable? potentially for even animal feed uh, because of their specs or what has occurred with them. So this makes it very, very challenging. And as a state, we have struggled with this like anyone else. And um, I guess I won't pretend that Vermont is perfect because I don't know that there are a lot of easy answers. Um, but I am here to share a little bit of what we've done and, and how we've tried to assist. Um, I also want to make sure that this is a place for you to ask questions, um, and we may take this conversation in many different ways. Uh, we may have some people here who are just starting out as food waste haulers that have questions. We may have others that are curious about where the agency is headed and want to get their questions answered. Um, but before I do that, I want to just share just a few uh, FYI resources for anyone here that um, that have to do with the state of Vermont and what type of things we've we've been up to and what might help others. Um, so for one, since we're talking about haulers and hauler roundtable, let me try and make this a little bit bigger, sharing my screen at the moment. Um, this is uh, information from the Universal Recycling, um, actually it's the food waste webpage on our website. And um, from that web page, have to make each of these bigger. You can download a whole host of resources. Um, and Zoom is interfering with my top banner. Okay, so one of those resources which I wanted to share is just how to collect food scraps. Um, in Vermont, we have all types of weather from extremely hot to extremely cold. We have toxicals to deal with um, where food waste freezes. And we have smelly food waste in August that has to be dealt with. Um, and then there's the contamination. You can see this poster here focusing on PLU stickers, which are just the bane of everyone's existence. Um, and by the way, are frequently made out of polyvinyl chloride, um, one of the more not nice plastics that are out there. Um, so in any case, we have created this resource for haulers to try and help them understand you know, how, they, how they might tackle this um, 
this issue, how they might avoid contamination, um, what they might accept or what they might um, not accept, depending on how they um, they choose to operate. And, you know, the, the compostable disposables is a constant question that comes up, or should I accept paper napkins and um, or should I not? Um, it's, it's really up to the, the hauler, but in general, we've found that if you just take food waste, you uh, limit contamination because it doesn't look like trash. Um, but there's a, those that really want to use compostables, and so that's a constant. Um, those are generators that, that struggle to find an outlet for it. So um, I won't dive too deeply into that topic because we could spend a whole webinar on that, but just an idea of how haulers have done it, what type of containers they've used, what type of uh, vehicles have they used. This is a box truck. Um, this is a trailer type system. Um, we refer to BioCycle Magazine, and then we just re refer to some winter tips and some other resources um, on this sheet. So again, this is downloadable from btrecycles.com, and you click on the Apple Core image for food waste scroll to the bottom and you'll have a whole bunch of resources there to download. I mainly just wanted to let you know, anybody out there know that these are available and can be used and they can be reformatted to fit your state or your community, depending on where you are. Um, next one, re really briefly, in Vermont, we've piloted and, and then formalized a Vermont food scrap hauler list. And we felt like as we rolled out the law, this was critical to demonstrate who was available to serve a generator that was impacted by the law. In Vermont, we had a two-ton generator ban per week go into effect in 2014. That ratcheted down to one ton per week, then it went to one-third ton, um, and one half ton, and then one-third ton. Each year, it ratcheted down. So people were needing to find service providers. And it was to our great uh, benefit that many haulers got into the game. We have over 40 now. I think it's more like 45 listed on this sheet. Um, and we, we list them by region as best we can. Um, so anyway, this is this is another resource for people to use and to look through um, to find their, their service provider. And we try our best to update this. And so if any food, food waste haulers are here, they don't see themselves lifted, or they know somebody who's servicing, um, please let us know. We will work to, to update this as best we can. Briefly on bears, they have been an issue in Vermont. They're definitely an issue in New Hampshire and Maine and other places. Um, this is a guide for dealing with that. Um, we are seeing more and more bear human interactions in Vermont. And so I'm remiss if I don't at least uh, discuss that. Um, and then lastly, defining food waste. So with a full food waste ban, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. There is the need to tell the regulated public, well, what are food food waste? And we have statute that dictates what it is, which is any food derived material from the processing or discarding of food. So we do consider coffee grounds as a food waste. And we also consider French fry oil as a food waste. Um, and so this sheet attempts to sort of walk people through, well, what do I have to do? Um, and, and I want to add emphasis, it says, it is a food waste if it's recyclable in a manner consistent with section 6605K of this title. And what does that mean? That's the food recovery hierarchy. That is the hierarchy that Vermont put into statute that emphasizes source reduction, feeding people, feeding animals, composting and anaerobic digestion as the pathways for, essentially the, the pathways for food recycling in the state. Um, and so when people ask us, can I throw this in the trash, um, this material, I'm not sure it's a food waste, we first sort of ask, have they, have they contacted any of these service providers to see if they'll accept it? There are some, some examples of when you don't want to compost something or digest something or, or feed it to animals, things that have chemical or biological um, damage to, to either animal health, human health, the environment, um, certainly those would not um, be accepted at these facilities and should not be and, and should be sent for disposal. So briefly, that's what this guide is talking about. In the Vermont law, there is a de minimis section that allows some small amounts of disposal of, of food waste in the trash. And essentially, we look at that as with a full food waste ban, any generator who produces food waste should have a separation system at their business or institution for food waste. And it's not perfect. That's okay but it should capture the majority of what they produce. Um, and an occasional small amounts of food waste thrown away is certainly um, could be considered de minimis under this, this section. 
Um, and we gave some examples that occurred to us as you know, really, really small one ounce packets of product um, that, that are not even suitable for depackaging. Um, there's there's many other examples. Uh, we have uh, been leaning on um, uh, storms that have caused power outages when freezers have gone down. Um, but there are a lot of service providers that still can handle some of that material too. So in general, this is a nice um, give, I think, to the system to allow food waste to uh, be diverted when it's when it's the most of it is available, but also not to make it the perfect to be the enemy of the good. So I won't go into a lot of detail here, but this is the best way we've tried to make determinations clear to everybody as to what food waste is um, and isn't. So you can see meats and bones are considered food waste, fat soils and grease, spent grain. Um, but then certain things in packaging, you know, they, they may not be fit for human consumption in some cases or um, and, and therefore thrown away. Um, and then there's also the contaminated or off spec things damaged by fire um, or having a biological contaminant could be considered uh, uh, disposal, disposal worthy, sort of, so to speak. So um, this was our best version of this. And this can also change as we get more questions over time. So that's the couple of resources that I just wanted to share with you all. I will stop sharing and um, open it up for some questions. And, and while folks are thinking up questions, uh, as Josh was talking, I sort of thought a little more about just in terms of generalities of some of the concerns we have about contaminants. I mean, uh, Act 170 takes a depackaging specific lien, um, but that doesn't mean that... Um, we need to focus on that here. I mean, we could talk in general terms about if you're a hauler, I didn't see a lot of haulers from Vermont, um, but there seemed like there was a couple of haulers in the room today. Uh, but if you're a hauler, why is it important to assure that there's clean organics that you're delivering to a facility? Um, there's a number of reasons. I mean, it depends on the, the outlet facility. It could be a composter, could be a digester, could be a farm that might be allowing animals access um, to that for foraging. Um, so there's a, uh, you could have an animal health risk there if there's if there's particulates in there. Uh, and as we're learning more about um, food and food packaging and, and some of these materials that are being used um, to package food, which is in itself a great thing because it extends the life of food, right? It, it allows us to ship it farther, feed more people um, and waste less in and of itself. Um, but we're learning there might be, you know, some physical or chemical contaminants that go along with that, that should they find their way into the organics, um, and into a digestion system or composting or even um, an agricultural situation, there could be some environmental or uh, even animal or, or other risks associated with that stuff. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to focus um, at the point of hauling. It's a critical piece of the system, right? Um, so it makes sense when you're when you're tipping the five gallon bucket or the tote or whatever your situation may be um, at the curbside or picking up from uh, whatever client. Um, to just do a screen and just make sure, hey, we, we found three pieces here uh, of contaminant, physical contaminant X that we pulled out and just let the generator know, like, hey, I think there's some room for improvement and we've, we're seeing these types of things showing up. Maybe you could inspect um, your process to find out how, where along your line these are coming into your organics um, and try to remove them up front because um, it, ultimately it doesn't matter what the destination of these materials are, no one's going to be harmed from accepting a clean food residual stream, right? If it's clean, everyone's going to win. So it does It does really make sense um, to focus upstream and at the generator and the point of hauling and pickup uh, as one of the checkpoints, not the only checkpoint, um, but one of the critical checkpoints in assuring that the system is working well um, and as a whole. Um, so I don't know if folks had any questions about contaminants or any haulers out there that may have issues or even experience that you've had um, in your hauling industry or business with customers or with certain contaminants or anything. Um, I'd, be, I'd welcome any experience that people have in the room um, if you're willing to, to speak up and share. And don't let me pick on people, but I know <laughs> I know Kelly Gleason is here with Casella. So Kelly, early, early warning that if you have anything to share from Casella and their, your organics collections, we'd be very interested. Dan Goosen is here from CSWD and Green Mountain Compost doesn't do a lot of hauling themselves, but is very knowledgeable in this space. And Brian Summers, could I pick on you? Because um, you are a representative new hauler, I know, and you're on camera too. So boy, you just got targeted. Uh, this is, and when, in, when I pick on you, I really just mean like, maybe you could just say, um, 
how it's going and how long your business has been operating. And, and if you want to ask any, you want to talk about challenges, you want to talk about um, questions, whatever, the floor is yours um, as I put you on the spot. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we've only been going since October, had a slow December, January, but we're, we're doing well now. Um, I guess we haven't really had any issues. A lot of our new customers are kind of early adopters who really kind of believe in the model. Um, you know, we get the odd compostable plastics that, you know, we kind of have to communicate with the customer that our CSWD doesn't accept Green Mountain Compost. Um, so that's kind of a hiccup of just, you know, it's, it's not us picking on them or like, pointing out that they're doing something wrong, but it, it's more trying to balance in the, um, the education and partnership, which we're trying to kind of massage that message in without offending any of the customers or rubbing them the wrong way. Um, we found it pretty helpful to integrate with our like routing software of like um, sharing photos of the buckets to reduce the um, communication error of at least identifying what these items are. Um, I don't so know. Do you send that directly to the customer or the photo of the bucket to their iPhone or something like that? Or their email Correct. address? I mean, if it's on top, you know, you get a photo of the bucket or it might be mid dump, but it's sometimes you, you don't get a photo, but if there is one, it's, it's always easier to kind of communicate that with them. And are we talking, Brian, just so just for context for people listening in, this is mainly residential customers at Curb? Oh, uh, yeah, it's pretty much exclusively residential. Um, mm -hmm. We're definitely small, kind of doing everything by hand. So uh, yeah. we can accept small businesses, but we're kind of on a, a weekly or every other week basis. So if that doesn't work for a business, it doesn't really fit in our model right now. Um, and you're using a yeah, vehicle or are you, are you using bikes or uh, what do you got truck uh, just one large pickup truck the dump yeah. body um, two separate collection areas one for food waste and the other for either uh, landfill on trash or single stream recycling great but thank you for sharing um yeah. I, I, this might be old news for many, but I, but, but as with Brian as one end of the scale um, at that smaller scale, and then with bigger companies at the other end, my knowledge is that um, rendering trucks with a rendering body that's modified is, is, is like the bigger size hauling scale that people can get to, which whether it dumps totes or whether it dumps dumpsters, um, but it's actually fairly similar technology to, to waste vehicles of all kinds. Um, and some have been equipped with washing equipment to reduce the need for liner bags, which can be pretty expensive. Also, they're just a hassle. But um, so there's just other ways that people have gone about tackling the issue of how to haul this wet, sloppy stuff that can, can be difficult. Um, I want to mention that in DEC solid waste rules, and Ben can talk to this more, there is an ability to have food waste drop-offs, um, which is sort of like, instead of setting up an entire transfer station, you're just focusing on food waste with a minimum amount of, what we'll call them toters uh, or, or rolling carts, but essentially like about two, two or three, I think, Ben, is, is what it is, maybe it's about two of them. Um, and there's at least one hauler that's piloting that. And there was a successful model in New Hampshire, it's no longer going on, I believe, but the hauler said that the drop-off model was as profitable in a way as driving around curbside, especially when you get out of a dense area. If you're in a rural area, that having people come to a central drop-off can really, you still are collecting revenue from them, but they, um, they, they do the hauling for you essentially, so that you're just picking up from one point source and returning them a clean bucket. Um, so that's a model that, that has been out there and piloted in the past. Yeah, and it's working pretty well. I swung through um, a number of those drop-offs relatively recently just to kind of do a scan for what was showing up in there. And, and uh, this particular company that um, that is hosting the drop-off locations does a really good job with education and outreach up front. Um, so kind of like Brian was saying, it's the choir, right? These are the people that are, have bought in. Um, 
And it was, I was really pleasant to see because a lot of them are in locations that are just, there's no operator there, right? So we typically think about waste being managed at a transfer station where there's an operator that can help direct things and provide instruction as needed. Um, but this is just a toter uh, sitting next to a toter of uh, shavings and some instructions posted there. So I was worried about just people stopping in the parking lot and throwing trash in there. Um, but that wasn't the case. It was really clean stuff. Uh, I was really happy with what I saw. I mean, it's only one point in time, but it was good stuff. And and like Josh was saying, it's um, it provides the hauler with this really critical uh, density piece. Like it provides like one stop instead of having to stop at you know 15 or 16 uh, places in the neighborhood. They just stop once and then they can tip and go on their way. Um, so it really helps sort of provide these anchor stops along the route in rural areas to really make it, uh, it sort of tips the econ economy of it for the haulers. So it could be a tool that some haulers could use. It doesn't necessarily get at the contamination piece, but it's a really kind of creative and um, ingenuitive thing that we have in our rules now that not a lot of haulers are taking advantage of. So a nice thing to highlight, Josh. Good call. Um, and on that note, another interesting program that's doing it is down in New York City. The collection department there is piloting or has been piloting for like a year or two kind of drop-off centers, um, which is the opposite of the rural collection. You know, it's the densest area possible, but you're not going to walk up apartment buildings to get five gallon buckets where they just bring it out. And it, it seems like it's been very successful as well. I know that there were some um, central Vermont a couple of years ago, I don't know exactly if it's still going on, was doing that for some of their apartment buildings as well, having a, you know, in condominiums certainly have a, a central place that townhouse type of residence. Um, Brian, we had actually a question for you in chat. Um, first, thank you just for sharing your experiences. But one question was it, whether haulers, and maybe you can just speak to your what you use and other haulers or, or Ben and Josh, maybe you have some ideas as well, but it's about software, those apps that you're using for either tracking customers, sharing photos, like what, what is the, what is the go-to app or, or program that you guys are using? Or are you comfortable? Um, yeah, I don't I mean, know if we're that's just, proprietary, but. Yeah, we're pretty much yeah. just emailing or texting them, the customers. Okay. We're very small, so we're, we're definitely kind of mm -hmm. massaging that into place. And mm -hmm. maybe it'll be a bit difficult when we grow a bit bigger, but um, no kind of big solve there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, Brian or Josh. Uh, I'm sorry, not Brian. Uh, ben or Josh, do you um, do you guys know or do you are you familiar with the different apps that folks are using? I know in other parts of the country there are a number of apps, but I'm I don't really have my fingertips right on them. I I don't have, <clears throat> you know, actually, I, I mean, Kelly Gleason's here from Casella, and they use a very sophisticated mm -hmm. software. That, and I'm only Kelly. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I'm. I am uh, only vaguely aware of how big, big haulers software works, but um, Kelly, do you want to speak to that? I mean, this is really major companies for waste that use a special application. Yeah. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yep. So um, I will just preface this with that I'm not in our sort of hauling end of things. Um, I'm more, I do our SWIP management, legislative affairs, that type of stuff, but we do use a routing software. Um, for hauling. And then um, we piloted in the town of Fairfax an app called Recollect. Um, and we're going to be rolling that out to some bigger areas. Um, it was only in that one town. I think now we're launching it in, in, in other states. And that doesn't really work on the end that we can't get things from customers, but it's really helpful in getting announcements out to people. So if there is a horrible snowstorm and we need to move someone's collection day, you can push out a notification to all of the users that have opted in. Um, you, We also have the schedule up there so they can see what days their collection is. And then I've actually been using it in our SWIP outreach where every month we push out a campaign that um, alerts them. They have to opt in to the notifications just like you would for any other app on your phone. But say we're talking about you know, it's their household hazardous waste day, it'll push an alert out to all the customers that there has waste days coming up or that this month we're focusing on how to separate food scraps and it um, gives them some information within the character limit and then sends them on to um, their town website. 
So um, I believe, I want to say that that's a Canadian based company um, when I sat in some meetings with them, but they were, they're really helpful and you get a dedicated account manager. And um, as we've tried to grow it and sort of pilot it, that's been helpful. It also, um, for the other swimmies on here, it comes with a waste wizard tool. So it basically just automates your A to Z list. So instead of having the entire list typed out on your website, um, we still have that, but you can also go in so they can do it right through the app and search. I have tinfoil, what do I do with this? Or I have um, you know, a compostable plate. If you're in an area where we can take that, it can say that there, but if we're in a district where they won't take that, it, you know, it'll, it'll tell you what else to do with it. Um, and so that's been really helpful too. Thanks, Kelly. I see to, uh, Toby put in the chat a link to stop checker. Toby, you want to say anything about that? Sure, Josh. Thanks. Yeah, it's um, I came across the company a few years ago, and it was a uh, you know a smaller hauler that developed software specifically for organics hauling. So that's why I liked it, and um, I probably know of you know less than ten, but you know quite a few um, organics haulers who have had really good luck with it. So I just wanted to throw it in as a resource. Thank you. I, I guess I want to say that I, if I was an expert in this, I probably wouldn't be doing this job. I'd be making much more money in IT. So, so obviously Ben and I are not, are not on the, the cutting edge. So thank you to Kelly and thank you to Brian for sharing and Toby. I, I guess I want to say what we, but, but we have learned that low tech in Vermont often is fine in a lot of situations. And so I want to share something that um, a resource that was put together that we put on the state's website. Um, so a lot of our resources are buried because we just have so much to talk about and you have to go and find them. But this is essentially a small scale food scrap hauling business budget template. It was, it's, it's tapping my memory banks now for who produced it, but it was produced by basically a, a consultant who does um, you know business planning. And it's just an Excel tool that anyone in the hauling industry who wants to get into this and start making sure that they're not getting over underwater in their business can um, can can start to look into this. Um, again, I can Ben's link in the chat to these resources. It's, it's downloadable from the food scrap um, page at the very very bottom under resources. Um, anyway, so it's here. There's a couple of different tabs. Um, you know, for inputs um, and possible loans. So it's it's available to just help try and help get people started in the industry. And and where we were with a lead up to 2020 with a food waste ban was really concerned that we didn't have a lot of residential capacity. And that has um, drastically turned around. Um, I, I will credit Casella. I will see uh, Casella uh, food waste toters out at residence, residential locations. Uh, in my own area, a smaller haulers, Vermont Compost Company also has those out. Um, Earth Girl Compost does in, in my area as well, which is more of the curbside bucket service. So there's been a number of investments made. Um, let me stop sharing this and then share one other thing. Let's see if this works. So one other resource, this is for anybody. So this is for both um, the folks like Brian, who's, who's, who's here with us, um, and other new haulers, but also people from around the nation and, uh, and North America who want to use these resources. This is the state's uh, signage page and symbols page where you can download for free the Apple Core image. And by the way, this Apple Core is starting to be used um, pretty broadly. It was copied and modified off of Seattle, Washington, and um, San Francisco's color green and use of an apple core to represent organic food waste. And um, I frankly just think Vermont's is a little clearer and crisper of an image. Um, we did fight a lot about how much the apple needed to be eaten, so we didn't waste food. But anyway, this is as good as it got. So you can download this image and use it in your business. It is open source. It's meant to be used. So um, also note there is a food donation icon as well as trash and recycling. Um, but mainly, I just wanted to point out the, the posters that we've produced for mixed recycling, um, food waste, and landfill. And it really tries to get at um, you know reducing contamination. Um, and talking about what's accepted in the food waste system. There is another one that is downloadable that really specifies what food, food scraps are. And some customers really need to be, you know, just encouraged to know what those are. Um, 
So in any case, these are not uh, the best of the best maybe, but they're pretty good resources if anyone wants to use it. And there's other examples out there. So I'll stop sharing. And Shannon, I see you uh, shared your camera. I didn't know if you wanted to chime in. Thank you so much for all of that. I appreciate the answers on the, the hauling software. Um, I live in Alberta in Canada and I've done some work with the town of Banff. They've had an organics, um, like a food scrap ban for about a year now. And you know, my colleague Carla there has had really good success. It's not a large community. It's about 10,000 people, but with 5 million visitors a year. So a lot of restaurants in town and they've had really good success with the photos. That's in that case, it's the municipality collecting all of the organics. And so they've had a lot of like a strong relationship with all of their business community, which has helped a lot. But I know I was just chatting with Carla last week and she said what a difference it's made just having the municipal staff take photos when there is when there are contaminants sharing it back. And and they found in that case, they do accept compostable containers and the like their the facility, their material is going to does accept those. But the, the photos and that communication and the relationship have made a big difference. I was involved in a waste audit a few months ago there and it was amazing to see the difference from a few months before their ban and a few months afterwards it was so notable the reduction in the food scraps in the waste stream so those policies really work so well thank you yeah thanks for that i i think what what i'm hearing from shannon is just what's what ben talked about at the beginning is sort of the relationship and the importance of uh, a customer relationship and this is not lost on brian who's who's building customers and trying to keep them and keep them happy and and Casella, who's been doing that for years, and I'm only picking on Casella because I see them here um, and a number of food haulers. But it's um, it is a constant relationship, and um, and I think the closer you get to communicating back and forth, uh, the better the results are. Um, I don't think that anyone wants to undermine the waste system with contamination, but with hiring and and you know staffing, things get away from people over time. Um, and so it's important to have a touch point. I want to mention that there are a lot of local governments here that do outreach and education. We even have some eco AmeriCorps who are, have been tremendously awesome in supporting in terms of outreach in the state and maximizing uh, the local government's reach to um, residents, businesses, and institutions. And so I want to thank you all for that work. I think it's been um, as the state of the state was presenting, Alyssa Eichler did an excellent job. We've been putting our shoulder to the wheel of the food waste ban three three times with a significant amount of funds, probably more funding than I've ever seen us put out for public media campaigns. But it still doesn't, it's not a replacement for human to human interaction. Um, and so it takes a lot of energy to do that, but it's critical. Um, and so Brian knows when he signs on a new customer, like he talks to them and then they, they kind of hopefully become bought in. Um, so, yeah, I just think that's really important. Josh, I think that's a really good point to emphasize. I mean, we're sort of focusing on haulers here today because this is the haulers roundtable. <clears throat> um, but waste management, specifically organics management and recycling, it, it's more of a system. It's more of a community of people that are participating. You have the generator, you have the hauler, you have the facility that's receiving the materials, but you also have the pl local planning uh, solid waste management entities here in Vermont <clears throat> that have um, local governance over the materials and play a part oftentimes operating transfer stations and doing some hauling themselves. So there's a lot of like networking that goes on uh, just in this, what seems like a really simple and straightforward activity, um, but keeping the lines of communication open and having everybody work together, I think is the way to ultimately um, assure a clean resource uh, for the receiving facility. And that's kind of what we're trying to get at with the draft policy that we have out now that we're still working on um, getting to final and responding to everyone's questions. We got a tremendous um, uh, response from the public uh, when we had that out for draft comment, which we're working through now. Um, but I think that's that's where we're trying to go with it is uh, sort of leveraging um, the sort of unique tendencies in Vermont here that we have. We're really fortunate because we have that sort of we have rural areas and we have more um, urban areas, I mean, not urban compared to big cities, but urban for our, uh, for Vermont, um, but it sort of runs the gamut, right? So we need sort of a, a very resilient network. It needs to be flexible. It needs to have multiple options and, and things uh, for it all to come together. Cause what works, you know, let's say in Canaan up in uh, the Northeast corner of the state, isn't going to be what works in Burlington. Um, so we're trying to come up with, uh, with a system that everyone works together and sort of, uh, sort of beats the same drum um, and ultimately uh, do what probably we're, we're uniquely set up to do in Vermont that other states are not set up to do uh, because we have the environmental mindedness, 
because we have a strong agricultural background, um, because we were an early adopter of the food uh, uh, organic bans for the landfill, we sort of have this like perfect storm uh, situation where I think we can do things that other states are, are unable to do as easily as we can. So we're trying to put that system into place and it relies on a lot of people to pull it together. Um, but I did want to put in uh, one plug while I'm, while I'm kind of rambling here. Um, we do, after the, the draft um, policy is finalized, uh, one of the things that we promise to do is to provide a, a series of resources to generators, to haulers, and to facilities. Uh, it doesn't make sense for us to start them now, which is why we don't have anything to share right now uh, specific to um, the draft policy that we have, which I'll put, I'm going to put a link in the chat for the draft policy just so people have that because we've referenced it enough now. Um, but if there's any resources that folks would find useful or any resources that you know of that you thought were great that you wanted to share with us that we can use um, to develop our resources going forward, we're open, Josh and I are both open to that feedback. So um, feel free to reach out to us and just let us know, hey, I'm a hauler. Here's what I think we could really use in terms of dealing with a generator or even with a facility or with the local district or whatever. Um, whatever resources you would find helpful, it's all on the table and we want to support you as best we can. So definitely um, let us know what you think there. And I know we do we do have a number of folks here from the planning uh, sector. I don't know if, if anyone from one of the districts or entities wants to chime in um, on what has worked well for you in terms of uh, interfacing with haulers in terms of organics management or any stories or successes even, uh, that might be something that would be helpful to hear from, from some of the districts, if you're willing. And while folks are unmuting, if anyone wants to ask a question in the chat, so you don't have to be on camera, that's fine. If you have a burning question you've wanted to ask of, of the people here or of the state, feel free. Um, while we're waiting, I'll share one more resource, which I, I probably should have shared at the beginning. Um, which is this map that Vermont put together, make this a little bit bigger, of, it, it was a materials management map, but it was initially developed for food waste and food waste collection. It was meant as a, as a way to match up organics entrepreneurs, those that wanted to invest into the system with generators of waste and, to, and for the generator to know where a place to recycle was or where a place to, to compost or divert organics was. Um, so it's a little bit crowded at this stage. I just want to point out that when you open this tool, this is from vtrecycles.com. It's at the very top. It's the find the facility link. And it's an interactive map, just like Google Maps. It's very familiar to you. Um, and there is a user tutorial video guide so you can learn how to use the mileage calculator or how to figure out what generators are where. Um, but as you zoom into the map, it takes a little while to load, you will see an estimate of generators. Um, and it's just taking a while. Whoops. Yeah, it's loading. Anyway, as you zoom in, you will see actual restaurants, supermarkets, schools, um, hospitals, and the like. So there, now it's going. Okay, let me go a little bit closer. You'll see the red fork icons. And then as you click on them, it tells you who they are um, and tries to estimate, you know, what type of how much food waste they might produce. There's also food rescue organizations which are mapped here. Um, but Vermont piloted this to essentially uh, demonstrate where the best hauling routes would be. Um, I found that most haulers are pretty knowledgeable about where it is. The population centers are pretty obvious to people and travel patterns are pretty obvious. But I think the tool was helpful in showing and demonstrating where um, materials were available to be collected. Um, so again, it lo it locates the business, um, and if if we have contact information, it's it's there um, and estimates how much food waste they might produce uh, based on our one ton, two ton ranges. Um, it also has redemption centers as well because we regulate that as well. But anyway, so this is that tool, and I will. Stop sharing now. And some links are being shared in chat. Um, thanks, Ben, for dropping in a link to that map and um, and to Shannon for sharing uh, some of the content from uh, from British Columbia. Actually, we used um, Seattle's video of contamination, which they gave to us to use, which saved us a 
bunch of money on our outreach campaign, um, which was really about getting contaminants out of the food waste stream. Um, and that was super helpful at the time. I will mention that uh, from my outreach knowledge, there's a sort of a wrestling between you, whether you use photos or whether you use uh, icons or drawings. Um, we have found a little bit that people can easily see drawings more quickly than they can drawings or images of um, sort of mock-ups of food waste or contaminants easily that way than, than with actual photos, because photos can be different lighting and they, they can really differentiate pretty quickly. Um, pros and cons there, people argue back and forth. Um, but the visual is really worth it because many people don't read and I'm one of them. I often skim and then I look what's in the bin and then that's my behavior <laughs> as I fall asleep. Um, Natasha, anything else mm -hmm. you know that people might um, be interested in or that you're aware of in this space of food waste hauling? You, you have a lot of expertise in the organic yeah. Well, um, I'll just add that one benefit, whether it's photos or those drawings, is that it it also bridges language barriers. Um, so people who are not necessarily speaking or native English speakers, it's, you know, people can look at a picture and look at what's in their hand and, and connect those lines. If, if folks um, are either living in a really multilingual place and you can't necessarily have translations in 10 languages on a poster, um, but translation is something that uh, that we should all increasingly be aware of. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll just say from from constituents that I talk with for the Composting Association of Vermont, I, you know, I'm really happy and I think one of the things that you all are addressing at the state is sort of leveling this playing field because there are some haulers who really put a lot of time and money into uh, education and training and and outreach and all of that to get clean streams and it can be sort of disheartening when they go and tip at a place and they're like, that someone else is next to them tipping at what looks to be a contaminated load. And so I think the steps that the state is taking in terms of leadership of um, of addressing that and creating some more just like across the board policies is going to be really well received and really helpful, especially for a lot of the micro haulers who are getting, I mean, I think we need the full range, right? We have really large generators and we have people who, you know, a five gallon bucket every two weeks is plenty. And so we need the, the, uh, the hauler infrastructure that supports that full range. And I think having some of these uh, policies that are across the board will be really helpful to encourage that development. And also just being really sensitive to the fact that, you know, generators are haulers customers, as, as Brian mentioned early on. And so there is a little bit of that uh, dance that that might, you know, people need to feel if, if there isn't a level playing field. Um, and I, I think it's just, you know, I think it's great to also have, um, you know, haulers have an opportunity to talk to each other and, and share sort of the tools and tricks that they're using with each other, because I think we're in a place where we really are seeing, starting to see and need more innovation in terms of hauling equipment and the totes and the types of dump trucks. And there's a lot of different options. And this is growing. It's a growing market because there is more demand for it. But you know, there's a initially sort of trying to use the same trucks for trash and recycling collection. You know, it is a whole different ball of wax, so to speak, when you're some suddenly carrying, uh, transporting potentially sloppy food waste, so um, or food residuals. So I, I think those are the things that we're looking for, and I think that there's definitely a lot of room for. Um, for clearer guidance to get everybody on the same page. And, and I know that's what you all are working towards right now with the draft policies that you've been mentioning. Um, yeah, Harry, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi there, um, I'm Harry. I work at uh, Chinden Solid, Ch Chinden Solid okay. Rose Districts, you know, Compost. Um, and uh, I, since January, I've been really focused on helping uh, uh, develop our new contamination policy, which is yet to go into effect. And uh, a big part of my job has been uh, doing periodic load checks on hauler loads coming in. And uh, just one thing to this conversation that felt worth uh, adding it, adding is that one consistent finding that we've had with uh, load checking uh, hauler loads is that uh, small scale, especially residential uh, haulers and uh, generators, we have not had uh, large contamination issues. And so haulers are really doing great 
um, in that respect. And um, in terms of uh, haulers trying to reduce contamination, uh, what we've been finding is that there's a really direct correlation between the amount of uh, what we'd call like multi-point generators uh, being hauled and the amount of contamination. So by like multi-point generators, I mean a generator where there's a lot of different people putting compost in a food scrap collection bucket, um, uh, you know, businesses, schools, things like that, um, or any, yeah, anything, any type of generator that has a lot of, uh, that has a lot of uh, multi-point uh, people. And um, yeah, so just adding that to the conversation of a uh, small scale uh, generators and haulers hauling from those generators are doing great. And so contamination is uh, we're realizing we need to really be focusing on those, uh, uh, on these uh, more varied types of uh, generators. Harry, thanks for that. I will comment that at the generator level, when when we were talking, when we do out doing outreach, uh, when we do outreach to direct to generators who are beginning a food waste program, especially at the cafeteria level or ski area or restaurant, we often talk about starting with back of house because that's where they can control it a little bit better. Um, and then, but many are like, you know, when we start talking front of house, maybe their business isn't set up to bus tables. And so they want the customer to do that activity themselves. And that just enters, that just adds such a level of complexity that, um, you know, the generator will argue, well, we don't have the staff time to police that or stand by there or manage that. And um, so you get these trade-offs very, very quickly when you get into that post-consumer world of food waste. And it becomes how many people touch it and how well they do, how good is your signage, how, how small is your bin, um, but then it fills up. There's just all these complicating factors. Um, somebody wants to use compostable disposables. Somebody doesn't. Somebody doesn't accept it. This person does. Um, these are the challenge and pinch points. I want to, before we go, though, I wanted to mention animal feed briefly. There has been advocates who have advocating for animal feed in the mix and, and higher up on the hierarchy, which it is higher on the hierarchy. Um, I wanted to mention that the agency also revised our hierarchy policy. Um, and we share promotion, we, we promote animal feed when it can be done safely, but the regulatory oversight lies with the Agency of Agriculture. One of my uh, colleagues from Agency of Ag is here. So I, I guess I just wanted to mention that for about a decade, we've been working on the rollout of increasing animal feed with the Agency of Ag. There are state veterinarians and other staff, um, but to promote it in a way that is as safe as possible in, in, in their regulatory oversight. If any haulers, um, want to be uh, acknowledged for their animal feed practices to, to suggest to customers what they're able to do, they can do that. And, and it's hard for us as the state, we have this food scrap hauler list, but it doesn't actually differentiate who has access to animal feed sources. And many haulers provide multiple options. Well, I can bring, like, I'm aware of haulers in Maine that are managing brewery residuals like grain, and they're sending it to this outlet. The hauler is sending multiple trucks to multiple locations. So it, so it really depends on the material. Um, so I just encourage haulers to diversify as they like, to consult Agency of Ag on safety, on animal feed practices, um, and to communicate with customers when there's a food source. I remember early on a potato chip manufacturer where they have high value fats that pigs really want. And so they were prioritizing getting that to pig feed. And, and that's exactly ideal when it can, when the marriage can work well. Um, but there are also quality assurance, quality uh, uh, controls that need to be in place to make that happen. And I'm very aware that that's difficult for some facilities. So that's just the tip of the iceberg on animal feed. Ben, did you have some thoughts, though? I, I just uh, I wanted to talk a little bit, and I know we're kind of at time, but really briefly, Harry brought up a good point that's not related to hauling directly, but more facility based. And this is something that relates to the system and the network that I was talking about that we're trying to implement. So I just wanted to mention it here. Um, we are going forward in all the composting and, and, and any facility that receives organics, right? We're going to be having um, in their certification process, uh, we're going to be having them develop protocols in their facility management plan to do random load audits, just to verify any physical contaminants, any visual physical contaminants that they can see uh, in the loads. And then have a communication program to the hauler and or generator if it can be determined. Um, and then also a, an avenue for them to communicate with the state if there's a chronic problem. So that's gonna be something we're gonna be 
implementing in certifications, but also developing some guidance on how facilities can do these random load audits. Because as you as you can imagine, sifting through a bunch of old organics to find a couple PLU stickers is, is not easy or fun. Um, so we're going to try to come up with something that's a little bit um, uh, more of a protocol that people can follow. It's just tricky to do, uh, but we're reaching out to a lot of other entities to try to develop that resource. So that's something we have uh, flagged going forward that hopefully would be helpful for people. So thanks, Harry, for sharing that. Indeed. And uh, Toby, thank you for chiming in. Um, we are at the hour. Thanks, Toby, for responding, responding to Jonathan Rubo about compostable packaging, which we could we could do six more hours on that. Um, I will I will defer to the expertise of Eco Products. Toby Alves is here. Um, certainly could go into depth with him on questions about where that stands, how that is evolving space. Um, there's also some sponsors that Natasha mentioned that also innovate in this space. So um, feel free to reach out to Natasha to get connected with them if you have questions about compostable products, and as well as the, the composters involved in this, this webinar, um, in, in these sessions, they also have unique perspectives. Um, so with that, I think, Natasha, I'll hand it over to you. I think we're at time. Yeah, we are. Thank you. And I just put a link. Um, we don't, unfortunately, have time to get into compostable packaging, um, as Josh mentioned. And thanks, Toby, for chiming in. But I did drop a link into um, uh, the chat for last year for we had a whole session dedicated to compostable packaging and that is recorded and is a is a resource that uh, that I wanted to share and so there's a link to that um, and so yeah and Ellie thanks as well as is on and, and she's another resource feel free folks to reach out to me if you do want to be connected further um, and so yeah thank you to everybody participants for um, for joining us in this morning's session. Um, thanks Ben and Josh as always for sharing your information and the good work that DEC is, is moving forward. Uh, it's an exciting time right now because we've been doing this sort of long enough that we're like, oh, hey, you know, like we're gonna role model iterating because as we learn and get more experience, that's like, this is the, the thing that we need to do in the organics management field, right? Is continually learn and iterate. Thanks, right. Tasha. Thanks everybody.